this out of the way. Perfect. So this is my re-recording of the confirmatory factor analysis for uh, second order models because our first recording was on the craziest Wednesday I have ever had in my life. <laughs> so what we're going to cover in this lecture is second order confirmatory factor analysis. And so what we've been talking about is just regular CFA models, and now we're just going to make them more complex. So second order models comprise really of two different types that we're going to look at. But it's a second, it's a second order model if it's one that has some sort of structure that's ranked or ordered um, specifically. Right? So we'll look at hierarchical models or higher order models where we use latent variables to predict other latent variables. So they're structured so that latents influence other latents in these sort of levels. Okay. That's the most common type of second order model. However, we can also create bifactor models. And these are generally used to describe a CFA with two sets of latent variables that are not hierarchical, but they are in a sense ordered. Because we describe these as models with a general domain factor and then subdomain factors. And we're really interested to see if items still correlate to their subdomain factors after accounting for the general factor. So you can kind of think as bifactor models as sort of like a hierarchical regression, but that is not how they're run. So the basic idea between a for a higher order model is that you have some latent variables that are represented by these observed variables. So they predict our measured variables, where they're indicated by our measured variables, whichever version you like best. And the portion of the variance in the latent variables could actually be explained by some second latent variable. And really what we're trying to capture here is the relationship between the latent variables. So we're arguing that that second order latent is the real reason why we get these correlations between the variables, not just because they're correlated. We're actually predicting or giving a causal reason um, for why the correlation between latents is what it is. And so we're basically switching out covariances between factors for another latent variable. And this will tie into our fully latent models that we'll do next week. And you'll see that these are actually technically also fully latent models. So when are these types of things used? Well, when we have multiple latent vari variables that co-vary with each other by a lot. And that is really handy because often the solutions when the correlations are too high between variables is just to collapse them. And for some theoretical reason, let's say you really want to retain that structure of keeping them separate. So we can use this second order variable to account for that correlation. And we're either doing that hierarchically or not. So that second set of latent variables explains the covariance that we see between the original set of latent variables. Okay. So here's an example. This is the original here on the left where we have very high correlations between latents. I mean 0.88 is so high there is really no distinction between SC and SD here. You really should not probably have them as separate latents but maybe there's some reason to keep them separate. What I could do instead is put up a overall global factor that predicts all three of them okay. and says, well, the reason that we have this interrelated variance is because this other latent variable is really the cause for these three. So practically, we've gone from three covariances and correlations to three loadings. And so in a higher order model, the covariance of that first order is accounted for by the second order plus some sort of specific factor. Okay. And so specific factors here are error terms that can't be explained by the second order latent. Okay. And so that's essentially the, um, now the variables are originally were exogenous only yeah, 
and now we've made them endogenous and exogenous, so they're going to have this error term. So effectively we're saying, well, the co covariance between these latent variables is actually because of this other variable and some leftover error that we don't know. And so that higher order is thought to directly influence the lowest level, the manifest variables, through the first order. So that's this. Okay. This higher order variable is the cause for these three separate latents, which is then influencing the manifest variables through them. Okay. So it's kind of this trickle-down effect. Now, um, the tricky part about all of that is identification. Okay. So I would say that identification is tricky all the time <laughs> because it's always a concern that we have to have. And so each portion <laughs> excuse me, of the model has to be identified. So the lower level latent part and the upper level latent part. And so the section with each latent variable has to be identified in some way. And we'll see this next week too. So the sections with the latents and the sections with the, the measurement variables have to be identified. So we can achieve that in a couple of ways. We can continue to set marker variables, as long as we have at least three. Okay. Some of the loadings in the upper higher order portion of the model could be set to equal by giving them the same name. We could set the variance of the late upper latent to be one we've mostly avoided this because then we can look at all of the standardized solutions oops, excuse me instead of just looking at one or i could set some of the error variances to be equal on those middle the latent variables so there's kind of a lot of places to do this this controls degrees of freedom this helps do with scaling I would say that mostly we'd set some marker variables at the top um, by convincing Levon to use the um, marker variable coding by setting our new latent up just like we set up the old latents. Now take a switch here, let's talk about bifactor models. What is the difference between a higher order or, or a hierarchical model? and a bifactor model. Well, bifactor models are special where they have two sets of latent variables that aren't hierarchically structured. Okay. So yeah, these are called second order models. Um, one of the types of second order models is hierarchical, one is not. Because that second order is useful at understanding kind of a global effect. So these are best used when we have this sort of general factor that we I think accounts for the manifest variables directly. Okay. IQ is a popular measure of this. There's some sort of G factor or better, better example. Um, there's a really famous scale, the depression, anxiety, and stress scale. We use it as an example a lot in this class, but there's like a higher order factor there, right? That the factor of just psychological issues, I would call it psychological distress, but, um, that would work, right? problems. I got problems, man. Right. And that's our general factor. And after we account for that general factor, stop. What we can do is then say, well, accounting for just distress, then can I break that into depression, stress, and anxiety? Because those three things are heavily related. Okay. So that's our general factor, distress. And then we might have our domain specific areas that we think also influence the manifest variables. So instead of saying this trickle down effect where, you know, um, distress turns into depression, which influences the variables, what we're saying is it's distress plus depression. So we're taking that intercorrelation between the um, latent variables and moving it to this other variable as sort of a separate causal factor. So that it's this plus that. And so this is what kind of an IQ version of this looks like. So notice how like visually very different this is. So instead of IQ predicting verbal reasoning, right, we've taken the covariances off of this side 
I'd say, well, the reason that they're correlated is because there's actually this other factor that we haven't accounted for that predicts all of them. And that's what makes it a bi-factor model. There's two sides. There's a general domain side, which here is on the right, and a domain-specific side, which is here on the left. And so it's the general factor plus verbal reasoning. That's a different causal um, explanation, even if it's not causal in the fact that I know that this is causal. It's a different predictive explanation than saying it's IQ leads to verbal, which then leads to these items. And so you can test both and see which one you think fits your model better. One thing to note in a bifactor model is we're going to leave all the uh, exogenous variable correlations off. So we will have to specifically turn those bad boys off. And that's because we are saying that that domain specific area, the correlations between them originally are now moved over to the general variable. Okay. So that's on purpose. So the difference is kind of summed up together. A hierarchical model says that the second order latent variable influences the first order latent variable, while a bifactor model says there's two sets of latent variables that are both predicting these questions, and so we need them both. And that really is like a very different structural question. You know, is it X leads to Y, which leads to Z? Or is it X plus Y leads to Z? So those are the different questions we're answering. So some advantages. The nice thing about these models is it really allows me to separate out how we're predicting this variance. Right, so the first order latent's influence on the manifest variables is separate from the other latent variables or you know, the higher order ones or not. Okay. And then for the bifactor models, the question becomes, after accounting for the general latent variable, is there anything left in the domain specific area? Or do we have some questions that actually only measure general domain and then only measure domain specific things. So there's a couple things we can get out there. Can you quit? We got a bad dog here. So, <clears throat> all right. Now I can compare models with and without our domain specific areas. And then in a couple of weeks, we'll get to multi trait, multi method models. So we can start actually using this kind of concept to understand how much of our model is due to the data collection method and how much of the model is due to the actual traits we're interested in. So we're going to use IQ, I know, but it makes for a good example. Okay. So in this example, I have more of the WISC. Remember that the WISC is the intelligence scale for children. Okay. And I have a bigger subset of it. So at this point, we've seen this kind of inter, um, importing of covariance matrices several times. Remember, if you have the raw data, use the raw data. Do not co convert it first. The only reason we're doing this is I'm using textbook examples, and they give us this data. Okay. So let's start with a first order model for the WISC. Okay. And the, the especially we'll do this next week, but the big thing is always start with a measurement model. Because if the measurement model doesn't work, nothing else is going to work. Okay? So if the CFA don't run, you ain't happy. So make sure that that measurement model is appropriate first. Because if it's not good, magically adding a second order of latents is not going to make it better. It's still going to be a shitty model, this time with second order latents. Okay? Then we should also look at the co covariances between latents. Because if they're really small, this is also not going to work. Okay. So these are really important um, for models with multiple latent variables that are intercorrelated. So let's build the model. First step, build the model, right? So what we've got is our four latent variables for the WISC that they think exists. Now some of these only have two 
um, measured variable. So we'll just have to keep an eye on the fact if this is identified by not setting them equal. Okay. And it runs, so it's probably okay. So we're going to fill in the model. This is all code you've seen. Let's summarize the model. Okay. And so I just want to, uh, again, add in the notes, just what should I check? Okay, we're going to go over this a couple times. I should make sure that the variances are positive, the square multiple correlations, and the, so that's R squared, and the regular correlations, so covariances, are less than one. And if you get either one of those, it'll actually give you a warning in the CFA. No error messages, so that's the warning part. And the standard errors are not huge. Okay, that varies based on the model. Then we should look at our estimates. Do our questions load appropriately? Okay. And then model fit. So what do the model fit indices tell us? And should we use modification indices to make our model better? Being careful not to overfit. So that's our checklist every time, every model. So let's do it. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Now if we get an error message, more than likely the error message will show up here. And in the next couple weeks, we'll, we'll make some happen for you. Okay. But you can still run the summary to examine the error messages and see kind of where they're at. Okay. But don't trust a summary with an error message. It's only useful in debugging and fixing your model. Okay. So do not present the results from a model with a negative variance. The whole thing's useless except for the figuring out what's wrong part. <laughs> all right, all right, let's see here. Um, if I zoom out a little bit, we'll get the whole thing together. So are our variances positive? Good. Are our squares less than one? Good. Are our correlations, so standardized all here, less than one? Good. Whoo, they're high though. Whoo. Okay. No error message. What about our standard errors? Not looking good. So, how about our interpretation now of the loadings? This is the measurement model. Do they all appear to load pretty strongly together? Yep. Okay, it's all above point three. What about model fit? Let's see here. Oh goodness! Look at our CFI. Point nine nine. Point nine eight. This is made up data. <laughs> so good. This is the REMC is good and the SRMR is good. So this is a good model. I don't probably shouldn't touch this. I really can't make it much better. Okay. Now, what does this tell me when I look at these covariances? This is a good candidate for a second order or a bifactor model. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, a hierarchical or a bifactor model because the correlations here are really high. And we got to account for that somehow. We got to justify leaving them that high and keeping those as separate factors. So that being said, the rules are build, analyze, summarize, diagram. So here's our diagram. And we can see, without being able to read the numbers, we can see that these are really strong correlations because they're nice and dark in our color shaded picture. And that these um, lines here are all pretty dark, indicating that they'll, they load onto their latent variables pretty well. Now, I bet if we looked at modification indices, we'd see a lot of correlated error terms because they, these correlations are so high up here. Okay. Probably should be one factor, but we can test that, so let's do that. Um, so in our first order model here, we find that the correlations are pretty high. That's a good sign that maybe a second order model can be appropriate. Or we should do a one factor model because they're really not distinct. Let's try a second order one now, a hierarchical one. <clears throat> to do that, all we do is create a new line here. I put a space here just for visual purposes. They don't have to actually do this. You just have to have a new line. And we're going to do equals tilde. So we're going to build a new latent variable called G. That's all of them added together. Okay, so the only rule here is that order matters. You can't use GC up here. Uh, I'm sorry, down here until you use it up here. <laughs> so you have to define their first order first and then the hierarchical one second. 
And by using this equals tilde, we're going to force it to have a marker variable to help with identification purposes. Cool beans. Build. Analyze. It's the same analyzation. An analyzation. What am I saying? It's the same procedure. Right? So just change out the name of the model. This is where you have to be careful cutting and pasting <laughs> that you change the name of the model each time. All right, summarize. Now, a note. All we have done here is go from covariances to predictive lines. So, what, what happened to my slide? That's good and weird. There it is. Okay. The fit indices really shouldn't change. So look here, we got 31 degrees of freedom in this model. So let's back up. Here we've got 29 degrees of freedom. Okay. So we've, I'm sorry, that's model user. Yeah, 29 degrees of freedom. So we've changed degrees of freedom just a little bit. Okay. Because what we've done is we've added um, we've changed from covariances to direct lines. Okay. And so we went from one, two, three, four, five, six covariances. Man, math is hard. Hold on. It's late. One, two, three, four, five, six covariances to four regression lines. One, two, three, four. Okay, so we've dropped some of those covariances, okay. um, which is the main difference here. In the degrees of freedom. But the fit indices in general really shouldn't move around a whole lot okay? because we're really shifting the the relationship from being covariances to to regressions right if we scroll down and zoom out we'll see that we've there are no more covariances they's gone because we just added all of the prediction prediction lines here so we went from six covariances um, to technically four regression lines, but we, we have one that's a marker variable, okay. um, but we add in the estimate of the variance for G. So we've, we went from six estimates to four, that's why the degrees of freedom are two different. Okay. And um, we're estimating these three and then the variance for G. So the degrees of freedom have changed a little bit. So the fit indices can also change a little bit, but practically this, a lot of this shouldn't change very much because that makes the model what's called invariant. Invariant models are a good thing. That means that the addition of these new variables does not change the measurement model. And the measurement model, we want to be good and to stay the same. Okay? If the measurement model is changing, based on uh, other predictors added to the equation, kind of depends on what you're doing, but in general, you don't want it to change. Um, that implies that the measurement model is not properly measured, right? Because it's, it's changing with some other outside variable. Right? And we'll have a whole week on multi-group models where we'll kind of look for this specifically. Okay? So they shouldn't change much. Practically, they might change a little bit if the degrees of freedom are changing. Okay, in our case, it is. But overall, our fit indices have stayed pretty similar. Right? They're not changing very much. Yeah. Now, we want to look at our fit, our um, all the same rules, but this model didn't really change. So all the positive, less than one, no more covariances, standard error looks good. Okay. Our items still load onto their factors pr pretty much in the same way. Okay. And this is the really interesting part. If we have high correlations, you'll have high numbers here. Okay. So now we're predicting, we're saying that the real reason that these are so intercorrelated is G, not just because they're intercorrelated. Okay. So let's diagram that, okay. which did, did some funny flash here. Anyways, so we're diagramming that. And so now we're saying, yeah, it's actually G that's the issue that causes these. Um, and then it is influencing these lower level latent variables through G. So it's G to GF to 
matrix reasoning in this example. So this is the trickle down effect. Let's look at it the other way, which is a bifactor whisk. Okay. And in this scenario, we want to build the model. Um, because we only have two indicators, we have to set them equal or the identification will blow up. Okay. And that's partially because of the way a bifactor model is set up. We didn't do this in the second order model because it ran okay. <laughs> very practically it ran so it was fine but bifactor models will not run if you have only two on the latent variable and don't set them to equal okay so defining the measurement model here uh, we would need to make sure that we um, set them equal to each other only when there's two so here where there's three this is okay After we define this measurement model, we're going to add the last component here, or the last factor here, which is G, which predicts all of the, the measured variables. So in the previous model, G predicted all of the latents. In this model, G predicts all of the measured variables. And that is like coding-wise the difference between these. Okay. All right. So let's analyze that model. The other thing we need to do is turn off the automatic exogenous only correlations that we get with this model. Okay. To do that, in the CFA function, we add this orthogonal equals true. And what you'll see that it does in the output is it sets the covariances directly to zero. We can do that in our model definition over here, but it's a big pain, <laughs> especially for five or six of them. So instead, we just say, hey, Levon, turn all those off for me. And um, the reason that we do this in a bifactor model is that we're arguing that those correlations don't exist uh, anywhere but in the, ge the general factor. So the general factor is the reason that those correlations are a thing. Now, this creates a somewhat very different model. I mean, the degrees of freedom are close. It kind of depends on how many uh, measured variables there are, but you don't have to expect this model to look anything like the other one. Okay, so let's look at our main rules here. Okay. So first one, are our variance is positive? Yes. Are our R squared values less than one? Yes. Are the correlations less than one. Oh yeah, because we set them to zero. <laughs> okay, this is that orthogonal thing. Cool. No error messages. No huge standard errors. Check, check, check. Now let's hold on this interpretation of how they're loading with their latent, because that's the main interesting question. Let's look at the fit of the model first. Okay. It's pretty high. Notice it's very similar because we're moving where the variance goes. Now this model is not perfectly invariant, it does change a little bit, but in general it's very similar. So you should expect sm maybe small subtle model differences okay, between these. Okay. And I don't know that I would directly compare these with AIC values or anything, they're not nested models certainly. Um, this is more of a, a, a theoretical difference. So if the models both look good you just have to, you would pick which one theoretically makes more sense. So the interesting comp piece to this is um, the standardized all column. But I do want to note here that this, note how this sets them to the same. Okay. But over here in our standardized all, we can see that they're, um, you know, a little different because of the way that it is standardizing these. Okay. Now, what... How do I interpret this model, I think is the question. From my own experience, so generally what people do is the first thing they look at is G, okay, the general, the general factor, whatever you want to call it. In this case, it's G because it's IQ, but the general overall factor. And I want to make sure that all of these items load onto the general factor, okay, and they do. And after accounting for that general factor, do the items still load onto a domain-specific factor? Okay. GC here does. 
GF does not. GSM for short-term memory, mm, kind of. It's very close to our kind of cutoff score of 0.3. Um, and then G just S does. So after accounting for the general factor, basically these two sort of disappear. Okay. So, I mean, we can leave them in there, but essentially we're saying that those two things are really part of this general factor because after accounting it for it, the, the loadings disappear. So this is what we did with the DAS model. It's built this kind of picture where after accounting for this sort of overall psychological distress, what you see is some of the questions on the DAS don't really measure anything else. So those are distress questions when then we had maybe a, a question or two that additionally measured stress or additionally measured anxiety. And this is a really nice way to test kind of, is this actually measuring two integrated concepts at once versus is it only measuring one of these two concepts? And then last but not least, diagram the model just for very good visual uh, indicator that it's not hierarchical. Every um, manifest variable has two predictors, two X variables. So it's G, C, and G. But G, F has pretty much gone away. It's just G. And it's G, S, and G. But these two um, um, middle ones don't stick really. Okay, we could probably drop them. All right. So let's build a summary of all of this, this time without so many interruptions. Right. So in this lecture, we've kind of covered more on CFAs. And this is really a scenario where you have CFAs with very high latent correlations. And super high latent correlations can be problematic when trying to um, estimate. So they can actually make a model blow up and not run. When I say blow up, not run, I mean you get an error message, you get a matrix not definite error, which you'll see next week. Um, it doesn't converge, it just doesn't finish. It's not a model I can present to anyone. Okay. And so that high correlation can be really bad for us. Okay. It also allows us to think about why are these correlations so high? So how to how can I account for that correlation? What can I do to explain it? Because otherwise it just looks like I have tried to separate out something that is one variable into three just because I wanted it to be three. Okay. I'm trying to give you a reason why I think it should be three. Okay. So we did this as a hierarchical model and also as a bifactor model. And then just answer different questions. So which one do I think works better for IQ? I personally think the hierarchical one works a little better for IQ because that's a, a main idea um, for IQ is that we have this um, overall IQ that kind of has these different facets to it that are very hard to separate sometimes because they overlap. But I can also see the bifactor model making sense. Like it's uh, this overall IQ Sometimes people think of this as fluid intelligence, plus maybe some of this extra attention stuff or this extra working memory stuff. Okay. So if I had to pick one here, I couldn't because I don't have any skin in the game on IQ models. Um, but for our depression example, okay, I think that it is overall distress with some extra little pieces added on. It is not hierarchical. Um, and that is just because we've looked at these models a bunch of times. And I think that in general, those three facets of psychological distress are very difficult to separate because depression, stress, and anxiety go together pretty well. And so what we're actually measuring is distress. And then every once in a while, we can capture these different psychological um, categories uh, over and beyond what we're measuring for distress. So that is uh, higher order CFAs. The next section we're going to cover is full structural models. So it'll be kind of another shortish kind of demonstration here. And then we'll kind of take a mini break from CFAs and start doing some of the other things we can do with SEM. So multi-trait, multi-method, latent growth models, and more.